Kia ora koutou. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It has been a long while since we have done a live. My name is Shine Vaught, and I'm so thrilled to be joined this evening with Jessica Hammond and Ken Peters. How's it going? We wanted to take a break from the pandemic and really start thinking, start getting you guys thinking about the future and where you can be involved with the party going forward. And so we want to have a really informal conversation tonight. And this is really your opportunity to ask as many questions as you want of us. Um, if you've had any questions or you've ever thought before of becoming a candidate, stepping forward, becoming more politically active, or that you just want to maybe help a candidate in your area. Um, so this is kind of going to cover both of those because, you know, next year we're going to be shifting gears and really moving into campaign mode. And I don't know about you two, but watching that video again, it just, it doesn't matter how many times I have seen it. It just hits so hard because here we are at the end of 2021 and I'm looking at these messages and it is so disturbing and frustrating and all those usual emotions just to sit here thinking we're now a year on from the last election and all of those issues all of the topics that we spent months and months campaigning on and talking about are just worse and it and i can just sit here and get really angry about it or just actually feel far more inspired and kind of reinvigorated um <laughs> i don't know how you guys feel Hundred percent, couldn't agree more. Shy, I um, a slight digression, but I've just been uh, with my work, been reading. Um, I probably can't go into too much details, but reading stories from NGOs who are dealing with people who are dealing with COVID, and just um, actually just crying, just about some of the things that people are going through. That is totally um, avoidable, and and knowing that we. We have a part to play in, in maybe making a difference for those people is, uh, well, that's why we're here. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. And and for you, Ben. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, it's, um, it's, it's frustrating that, you know, a year in and um, all, all that really fundamental stuff that we campaigned on isn't looking better. You know, um, our emissions are looking worse house prices have got so much worse um in, in, in a short amount of time you know it, it, i remember being on the the debate stage um with david clark and he was you know touting the big hospital build and, and how it's going to be all great and roses in dunedin and, and all i could think of and i said at the time like that sounds like a lot of people come into dunedin and house prices soaring and we need to do something about it and now a year on house prices are up you know 20 um 20 percent ish year on year it's, it's starting to get quite um uh, insane um, so yeah, it's seeing that same message and going, it shouldn't still be relevant, but it is still so relevant. Um, yeah, so so inspired and and really looking forward to to what we can do um, in a year or two. Completely. So what I thought is I'd ask you guys some questions, um, but to everyone watching, please feel free to put your questions in the box, and we want to. This is this genuinely is your opportunity to ask those questions that you've always wondered about what it's like to be a candidate or the process or just really whatever you would like to know. But I thought I'd start off the conversation by asking each of you, what was it that um, drove you to step forward and be politically active as a candidate for a political party? Um, Jess? Oh, yeah. Well, look, I, you know, we, we talk, Shai and I, Shai and I have talked a bit about how a lot of people need to be asked to be a candidate. Um, they won't um, come to it themselves. And before TOP existed, um, every now and then people would say to me, um, you know, why don't you get involved in politics? This was probably on some rant about something. Um, <laughs> and I would always say, yeah, but what party would I be able to stand up and put my hand on my heart and defend their um, policies? But you know, I, I, I could see, I can see, I believe in the importance of um, politics and government to people's lives. Um, 
I work in government, I work in the public sector, and I and I know what an influence government has. Um, so the second top was um, launched. I basically was put, put, put my hand up. I was like, yeah, I'm in. So good. And I, yeah, as you say, Jess, we have talked before about it. And I'm sure there are people watching tonight who probably fit in that camp as well. Something they might have, they might have always been interested in politics. You're watching our lives. You must have some interest in politics, but um, some interest in politics that never knew that it was for them to actually be the front face of anything. Um, and so, yeah, it's interesting that some of us do need a bit of a push. Um, but I guess this is just a reminder to tell people that um, you don't always need to be asked. It's um, sometimes you can just feel it and just feel motivated to do it. And it's scary regardless. Um, but yeah, um, mm. Ben, what about you? Yeah, I um, I started with top with the with the GE stuff. So if, if, if you've lived under a rock and you're joining us in a live for the first time, <laughs> um, I'm big on science. Um, and, and so I, I kind of, I got into politics more because politics was stopping me from doing my regular work. You know, I, I wanted to use science to its fullest and you hit regulation and you hit laws and you go, this is, this is dumb. This isn't making sense. Um, and then top was like, yeah, we love science too. Um, and, and I got brought in to do policy work and I was like, this is fun. I love this. I can, you know, I feel like I've made a contribution, um, started turning up to the local, uh, top, um, meets and I started talking about candidates and, and then everyone just looked at me. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> um, and, and yes, yeah, so and they, they asked if I'd, I'd be willing to actually stand up as a, um, as a candidate. And I mean, initially they, you know, the, the role of spokesperson was around. I was like, yeah, I think I could do that. Just stay in my little corner. Um, but yeah, they, they, um, a little bit of an ask, a little bit of a push. And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll give this a go. Um, and I think because it was top, I, I could do that. There weren't other parties that I would really look at and go, yeah, I, I can see myself standing up and defending X, Y, Z policy or history or things like that. Um, but with top being a relatively new party without a lot of that history and baggage, with it having policies that I looked at, I was like, there's pretty much everything here I agree. Mm -hmm. um, it helped me um, go, yeah, I'm, I can stand up. And, and also a process of learning that you don't have to agree 100% as long as you agree on all the core um, foundations, those fundamentals. Um, and so, yeah, when that that meshed with um, with me, and so I was like, yep, I'll, I'll stand up. And, um, yeah, I had to, to work out some little logistics along the way, but it was, um, yeah, it was a lot of, lot of fun. Yeah, that's such a good point as well, Ben, that for you it was creating policy first and then because you were already an expert in that particular, well, it started with GE, but you're obviously our COVID mm. spokesperson now. Um, and so that that progression is really strong because, of course, so important to us is that the policies that we put forward work based on evidence and uh, that we can proudly promote them. And so there might be people out there who simply want to help and work in the policy space because they are already an expert in that. And we welcome that um, with the caveat that you may be shoulder tapped to follow in Ben's footsteps and also turn that expertise into a spokesperson role. So yeah, I think that's really important to, to note. There's, all, there's lots of different routes into um, these seats, I guess. Um, and what yeah. about you, Shai? What was your road? Yeah. <laughs> um, not direct, I guess. I mean, I had been involved with TOP uh, for some months, for most of, I guess, 2019 now. Um, and I never intended at all for a moment to ever step forward from working in the background. Um, I also never wanted to work or, you know, commit to a political party before top. And so even just having had committed to a party was a big deal for me, let alone then um, stepping forward publicly in this type of a role. And it took many months of many people. I was also someone who needed to be shoulder tapped and many people trying to convince me over time. And Jessica was one of them. Um, and I'm so glad you did convince me because <laughs> um, in the end, for me, you know, and, and all of us, we do this because we genuinely want to make 
a positive difference for our country. That's why every single one of our candidates stepped forward last year. And to, to have the opportunity to do that, um, I would have been stupid to, to say no, and I would have regretted far more not trying than the amazing, crazy, grueling, difficult, and um, incredible experience that we had last year. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to absolutely resonate with that. The For me, the, the end point is I spent a while mulling it over was how would I feel if I had an opportunity to stand up, to go through the process, and I said no, and then just went along on voting day, voted and walked away, right? Like, how would I feel having missed that opportunity? Um, and for me, that was was kind of like the final push of, you know, like, I've, I have to run with this chance. Um, and so, yeah, that's been really rewarding. And that kind of brings me into what I was next going to ask you both, which is sort of what impacts do you feel candidates can have um even none of us successfully won our seats but uh that doesn't mean for a moment that we didn't impact upon other political parties and their policies which is wonderful to see some of top's ideas getting picked up um what what, what were your kind of experiences or perhaps highlights in that way do you want to go first? Me? Yep. Um, yeah, I, I really loved being able to get up on the debate stage. Um, and you know, we, had, we had quite a few candidate meets um, in Dunedin. And it was really, um, it was nice to be able to really grill my local MPs um, and my opposition. And, and like, I, I wasn't always in the space of grilling, but you can really show up um, some of those weaknesses. And, um, you know, being the, the town that we're in, um, you know, there were some really good questions put and it felt really good to be able to go, actually, here's here's what I think um, and be able to put that out to the public. Um, it helped shape some of that discourse. Um, and it meant because you, you had um, a top member there, people would talk about it and treat it slightly differently, particularly around things like housing and our UBI policy. We were able to contrast that with the Greens um, GMI and the you know, our housing policy also contrasted with the Axe. Um, Axe policy was just like, spread everywhere so there was like lots of good points where we could kind of go actually this is better and it helped the discourse and it also really helped me get to know the local politicians as well in a way that I've, i haven't you know like i actually got to know um david yeah. clark a bit and michael woodhouse and um and so that actually yeah. meant then that i you know at, at future meets and all that kind of stuff you are a little bit in their ear you know they know that that you, the kind of questions you've got to ask they know the answers that they can't get away with where they might have been able to before <laughs> Um, and that's come through, I think we've seen um, X brought in a, a GST to councils for builds policy, which is pretty much duplicated directly from top. So there is top policy that has been practically copy and pasted because they go, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> and they, they saw that because they met people at meets um, and, and things like that. So that's been really, really good. Absolutely. Yeah. You go, Jim. Yeah, so we so we influence the um, the conversation and we influence policy in the other parties, but also, I mean, the 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 numbers bear out that having a candidate in an electorate improves the party vote as well as improving the um you know as, as well as giving votes to a to a candidate, right? So it makes a really mm, big difference definitely. to to the to the party, which you know eventually is going to be the thing that gets us into parliament is basically having candidates, the volunteer teams around them. And, and having all those yeah. hundreds or thousands of conversations that you have um, with people out at events and at debates, um, that that you know really shifts the dial on our on our party vote. Um, but I don't know if you have had this, this experience, but I I do have people who still come up to me and say you made a real difference to the um, to the electorate, uh, you know, and that people people who knew about us was so happy to have someone to vote for not just someone who was going to keep out the people they didn't like mm -hmm. and i think that makes a real i think we make a real difference to we mean all you know i told you about that guy um in the supermarket the other day shy um you know we we, we do mean a lot to the to our supporters that there is someone who they can vote for who they really think can make a difference not just make things slightly less terrible i think that's mm. absolutely right even though we ultimately had a smaller voter turnout to, to those people the support is just so strong because yeah I, we hear it all the time even now like a year on from the election 
we still get messages about how important our message is to people because it is so different. And again, yeah, looking at that video at the start just kind of reinforces it every time. We are in status quo, status quo, year on, year out, and something has to give, right? And yeah, I mean, for me as well, being at those candidate, um, candidate event, meet the candidate evenings were by far my highlight um, because we could showcase our ideas against others and really challenge directly these ideas. And it's really the only time that, you know, to those, the members of the public who actually are coming and hearing all these ideas, it's really the only time they're in a room and with all the different ideas on offer and these are being debated. And the only thing I wish was different in that way is that there was so much more of them. I mean, granted, we were hamstrung up here in Auckland a lot with the lockdowns and things as well, but yeah, just finding ways to connect with the voters. And that was probably the most effective I found up here, um, for sure. Something, um, I'm gonna start looking at questions soon because I'm worried I'm gonna stop being able to scroll through them in a moment. So please keep your questions coming. We will start getting through them. Um, any questions around candidates, our lives as candidates, whatever you want to know in that regard, please put them in there. We're going to try and not get too political with you guys tonight because we kind of feel that most people are after a little bit of a lighter relief and a little bit of a lighter conversation. Um, but we will be getting to your questions just shortly. Um, so another thing, and we've sort of skirted around this, but it's sort of around the the idea that, you know, some people maybe think political candidates need to tick certain boxes or they must have had this type of experience in life or, you know, and I guess it comes down to a little bit maybe imposter syndrome. But um, what what kind of, did you have any experience with imposter syndrome or do you think there are any kind of, key qualities that people we need I guess um I'll, I'll start if that's all right Ben um yeah yeah go for it yeah for, from what I've from what I've experienced and from what I've seen there are a thousand different ways to be an effective candidate um and for me I didn't I, I not you know I don't believe in fate particularly but there are a lot of things I've done in my past that I for you know for instance you know theater or you know lecturing at um university or you know my um you know critical thinking skills from philosophy that I you know enjoyed them at the time but I didn't I almost feel like oh that's what I was doing them for um when it came to being to being a candidate so so for someone like me you know I um have some of those um sort of the skills around being comfortable in front of an audience and all that sort of thing but um i think we all go in as um as total novices we don't no one knows how to do all the things that a candidate has to do and everyone brings totally. yeah brings different different skills to it and we had um, a candidate, Kevin, in 2017, who I don't, I really don't think liked doing any of the video or the social media or anything like, anything like that, but he knocked on thousands of doors. He was great at it. It was, it was fantastic, you know. Um, I, I found, a, <laughs> I think I've probably told the story before, but the first time I went to one of the markets, you know, we'd show up at the markets every week and I went with my sister and we literally had one conversation because we're like hello hello <laughs> one conversation and it was someone who was trying to convert me to his religion and then, <laughs> and then you know my sister came again with me about a month later and she was like girl you've changed because I was you know talking to everyone and, and knew how to start conversations and um you know you don't you learn that stuff you learn that stuff on the job and we learn that stuff from each other and we support each other with the various um skills so basically I, long story short you don't need to know how to be a candidate before you start being a candidate you just start i i don't think no one knows it is such a niche specific job no one has done it before until you do it the first time and it is trial and error and just like jess said you know everyone had a different way of campaigning that worked for them for some people it was way better to be at markets, um, for example. And 
other people had different ways were stronger online and had a stronger social media presence than others. So you just find your own rhythm and what works for you, I think. Um, but a lot of mm. trial and error. <laughs> yeah, I found in terms of imposter syndrome, probably the most helpful thing was to not compare myself to my local MPs, right? Because they've been MPs for, um, at least in my electorate, both of them for you know a good almost decade. But to compare myself to the other candidates, you know, the, the, the ones from the, you know, the, the first time Greens candidate or New Zealand first candidate or things like that and go, actually, th these are people just like me um, in, in many senses. And so it was that, that shift is you're not comparing yourself to the very best. You know, you're not trying to be the best politician there is. You're trying to go, what, what can I bring? And what skill sets do I have? And I mean, like, I was terrible at door knocking. It was something I never got good at. Um, but, you know, I, I still got a, a really significant number of votes, and that was through other means. So I, I tried being a lot more active in some social media um, circles, even more things on, like, Reddit rather than Facebook, and, like, even different platforms. My Instagram to this day only has pictures of plants and the occasional <laughs> picture of me um, wearing a top T-shirt or something. Like, there are certain platforms I was just terrible at. Um, but other areas where I really loved and excelled, like the debate stage was one that I, I, I genuinely loved being up there. And, and so, yeah, it, it's there are definitely things where you can be um, better or worse at something and that, that's OK and it's mm. all right to have strengths. And that's ideally where you can you know get a good team around you. And I was really fortunate to have some fantastic volunteers. And so we got leaflets dropped all over Dunedin and, and we were able to go to a lot of these different markets and things like that. And the volunteers themselves would help engage. So there's a, a role for people who are, if you're, if you're good at markets, but you don't want to be a, a candidate, you can be a volunteer for that person and you can be the one going to the markets you know, on their behalf or helping them out. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of ways you can help. Um, and yeah, you don't, I say, don't try and compare yourself to the, the Titan in your mind, but, but look around it genuinely. Who is, who are these other candidates? And do, do you think you could be, you know, there? And like, yeah, yeah, I think I could. It's such a good point. Anyone watching now who's thinking, oh, okay, that all sounds good and well, but I'd still never in a million years be a candidate. That's fine because you probably have a ton of other skills. And if you would just want to put your time towards supporting the local candidate in your area, that would still be amazing. Because yeah, as, as Ben and Jess have both really said, like it's it's people around you. And um, if you can provide that support for a candidate, they're going to be so much stronger because of it. I tell you what, if I had, if I had a person along, I had a wonderful vol volunteer team, but what I, okay, this is my pitch to any of you watching, I need someone to organize me, you know, like, you know, you don't have to be someone who wants to be out there. I need someone to, you know, to, and, and if you, if you have one of those people, like a, a campaign manager or someone who covers your weaknesses, then you can help a candidate to be 10 times as effective as they would otherwise be. Most definitely. Yeah. If you can help us be as efficient as possible <laughs> with our time and as effective as possible, then that has a huge, huge impact. Um, I'm going to turn to some questions that have come through now. Um, someone asked around agreeing with, I've, I've missed the question, but I noted it from earlier. I'm so sorry if I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but was asking around whether you need to be a candidate um, to be a candidate, do have to agree with oh, there, Thank you. Thank you, Kane. Um, does being a top candidate mean you need to agree with every stance of the party? No. Not. And, and the reason why I say no, maybe you guys say something different, is you are never going to find a candidate in any political party that agrees with 100% of absolutely everything that a party produces. That is not human nature. It doesn't matter how aligned we all are in our values, which we are. And I think that is more important because we're all here. There are some key values that unite us and bring us to top as opposed to just being generally political interested and just picking any old party. We are here because the fundamentals align with us, our core. And so, so long as overall you are on message and it resonates with you because at the end of the day you need to be authentic if most of the stuff doesn't appeal to you and you don't agree with it then you're probably not going to be running for the right party 
But if, you know, there's just one or two little things, I mean, even for myself, there's the odd thing that comes out and I'm like, hmm, I mean, I wouldn't have picked it, but sure, if that's, if that's you know, what the policy committee says, then I'm, I'm on board. Um, so I think, yeah, you've got to be a bit realistic, but at the end of the day, when you are campaigning out on the street, the policies are the policies. I think that's kind of how I'd describe it. What about you guys? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it, a lot of parties have built in any way. There are, there are times when you have conscience votes, there are times when there's party vote, right? Mm -hmm. So there are, there are areas where we explicitly go that we're not having a policy here. You know, that this is actually up to a person's um, beliefs or stances on areas. And, and with top, um, one of the, the kind of the check, check boxes as I was coming in, because it's something I was you know, relatively concerned and interested about in politics. And you know, it's actually the, probably the one question my mum asked me was, what are you going to do if they tell you to stand up and say something, um, you know, that, that you don't believe in? And my answer was very simple. <laughs> well, I won't say it. Um, sorry if that, <laughs> that's going to um, bite in the, in the future. But one of the things with top that I found really reassuring is that we had um, part of our, our, one of our policies was actually a deliberative democracy policy where we looked at if, you know, there isn't strong evidence. If there is a gray area where it gets really tricky, we don't come down with a really hard stance just based on polling of the day or what one person feels like. We actually have a deliberative process to actually voice that out and sound that out. And so that was really reassuring for me. And it meant that when we had tricky conversations come up, um, I was able to go actually, you know, TOPS policy is that on these tricky issues where you have effectively just conflicting ethics questions and moral questions that aren't evidence-based, we go, let's go to the people. Um, and as far as I'm aware, that's still a top policy. Um, I, I don't know whether that, that one's changed or not. Um, so, it, and, and for me, that was really reassuring that when we got asked hard questions, I could lean on that and go, that's my, uh, if you want my personal opinion, I'm happy to give my personal opinion on this. The party broadly thinks this. And I mean, as a minor party, that's that's more and more true. There are so many, many things that, that can be covered um, and we don't have policy in absolutely every single corner. So there's always going to be a, an, an element of resting on, well, we will consult the experts. We will get to the point where we go, let's see what the expertise is in the area um, and we'll follow that as best we can. Yeah. Um, someone here has asked, um, oh gosh, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to scroll back down. Could you please explain the process of becoming a top candidate so thank you for asking that Ross uh, so again for, for everyone it's been slightly different I think um, in terms of us in this group but um, like I mentioned before if you were listening earlier on Ben um, was shoulder tapped because he had created policy in our in that space Jessica had been a really successful 2017 candidate um, and I had been working in the background of the party already and put my name forward. But um, re regardless of how you kind of get to the to the path, um, we always have a very, we had a couple of tranches of very thorough applications and interview processes uh, to, to meet you and for you to meet us as well and to you know, it, it, the interrogation doesn't go one way, it goes both ways because it's a big endeavour to step forward and become a candidate. So um, those conversations were always, here's what it involves, um, as well as trying to find out more about that potential candidate as well. So we will be moving towards opening up applications next year, which is why we wanted to get people starting to think about this before you head into your summer. And so hopefully it's in the back of your minds as you're on your summer break. Um, and we will be opening up applications. So the formal process will be well and truly publicised and explained and we want it will be completely open for everyone who wants to put a CV forward to do that. Um, yeah, is there anything you guys want to add about how the process worked? I would say um, definitely if you're interested and keen, see if there's any top group operating in your area. Um, because that, they're the people that you need to work with at the end of the day, they're, they're the volunteers who are already established. Um, so that's a really good um, starting point is actually who are the volunteers already? Um, and, and ideally, um, in my opinion, if you've already got a volunteer group, then those people have a bit of a voice in the candidate as well. Um, like I, I, one of my references in my CV was the, the local um, 
uh, volunteer coordinator because she was ultimately going to be organizing those volunteers and I knew she already was involved in top so you kind of finding someone already in top so as, as part of that kind of vetting process because you are at the end of the day representing the party and we want to know before you get on a debate stage that you actually do agree with at least you know that the core principles of what the party's standing for and things like that um, so putting in a little bit of that mahi early um, and, and being a part of that volunteer team is a really good way of just kind of demonstrating that that um, determination that that you will actually be you're keen and you're involved mm. yes um totally totally and for most of us i think the volunteers and coordinators who were already in place before the candidates were took basically adopted us and um were our teams so having those relationships even even at a point in time when you aren't sure that you definitely want to become a candidate that's when you should connect in with your local groups um hopefully one of the team is going to put in the email address um in the chat which i think is info at top.org.nz um for anyone who wants to ask any questions at all please contact our team um if you didn't want to put it in the chat tonight or if you think about anything in the future do do message and that's also the, a great way to get linked in with other top people in your area um yeah. i saw another great question come up before which was um wanting to know the average time investment per week for candidates uh, and how they are balancing that out with other work huh. <laughs> um, <laughs> so i mean like it, it, it really depends um for me um but that's because i wear a couple different hats uh so and and i know jess as well what war and, and shy obviously <laughs> a leader um we're not average candidates in that sense um so most candidates aren't also spokespersons and so that really does change the kind of the, the time commitment um and the time of year massively matters so like in the lead up to the election a ton um a year out from an election not a ton you know there's mm -hmm. quite a range um Definitely. so i i don't balance time at the moment i just don't sleep <laughs> um no this is not quite true um yeah so it, it is it's a very varied um workload depending on the kind of the peripherals um but just being a candidate in an area i think that we ballpark like five hours a week is that roughly as kind of like and then that for me there would be like checking facebook pages right if you set up you kind of your social media pages just kind of, kind of going over those a little bit um there's kind of like further out stuff um where you just kind of keep keep things ticking over start going to volunteer meetups and things and, and, and kind of that strategy planning stuff actual campaign season um as much time as you're willing to give is the that's totally right. I mean, that's the, there's there's no upper limit to how much in mm -hmm. yeah in sort of the three plus months and particularly the last three weeks when you'll have your meet the candidate events in those in those last say the last month you know I think it's there are still some people who are doing their day jobs but it is you know it it ideally is at least a full time job for those last weeks and you and depending on your area, you are going from event to event to event. And there is there is never enough time, which is why the volunteer teams are so important to to help support uh, candidates, particularly in those in the three months leading up to an election. But I but I'm sure um, I mean, we're, you know, very active, but, you know, there'll be there'll be um, candidates from 2020 who aren't really spending any time um, at the moment. But it, yeah it builds it builds and then it builds yeah. to an absolute frenzy <laughs> mm. yeah I, I think i did manage to other i think it took about the last week and a half off properly from work so i was one of those people that did manage to balance or balance um, but most of the meet events were in the evenings um so I, I could kind of do that and then during the day um nip out and do poster runs whenever i could and things like that um so yeah it, it is possible to keep working if that is one thing that is quite restrictive although i would there's like weird law around who can and cannot work during an election season um if you're a state servant or not so pretty much if you're on the government payroll for anything inquire about that because that has weird leave um impacts um which i had a weird legal exception for which we won't go there um, but the people asking about particular groups if there are volunteers active in those there's a couple of people asking um flick an email through to that uh info 
um, at top.org.nz, I think is the email address there. Um, mm-hmm. So we can actually um, answer those because it, yeah, it, we'll, we'll send that through to the, the volunteer team. Yeah, it really is. I mean, you guys have both said it, like it really is a role that you give as much or as little as you have. Because yeah, like Jess, it's absolutely right. There is no upper limit. There's, yeah. There is never enough hours in the day. And um, at the same time, we most people who will be candidates will have full-time jobs. And you will just only have so many hours in a week. And so it's up to you how you can allocate your time and um, figuring that out. And it's honestly not something that you come into knowing how it's going to work for you. You really will figure it out as you go and get into a rhythm that works for you. And I think, I, I don't know if we're getting to this question, but I saw someone was asking about things you can do to prepare to be a candidate. You know, if you want to be a, a candidate um, and you want to get ready for that now, being involved in your community now is a really good is a really good step, like being, you know, being known, volunteering for things, turning up, um, turning up at events, maybe wearing a top t-shirt, um, the better connections you have and the more you know what is going on in your area, the better. You could turn up to residents association meetings, mm-hmm. for instance, like sort of homeowner association type things, events. Council or, meetings, yeah. Yeah, um, that's good. That's good prep. That's such mm-hmm. a good, that's such a good reminder because, yeah, getting strong connections with your community who you want to represent is yeah really really helpful incredibly critical really um sorry i'm just looking at the well, another question which was about um i guess it sort of overlaps but question about actively looking for candidates in electorates where no one stands up is that um around oh there we go a top going to actively seek candidates in particular electorates if someone doesn't stand up Places like Christchurch where we are popular but have little representation. Yeah, great question. So um, absolutely, there are going to be key seats uh, that we want to make sure that we have a candidate in. Um, Christchurch is an excellent, excellent example because we were so strong in party vote down there in electorates where we did not have candidates. And so you just think how much better would we have done if we did have candidates in all those electorates. Now, we had Ben Atkinson in uh, Banks Peninsula and he was an amazing candidate. And unfortunately, we couldn't have him run in every single Christchurch electorate. Um, but yeah, we, we certainly, Christchurch is on our radar. We absolutely want candidates in all Christchurch electorates in 2023, um, most, most definitely. Um, so yes, we want to tick certain location boxes off, absolutely. Um, but outside of that, if we if there's a good candidate, even if they're not in a typical you know top strong location, if there's someone willing and able to be a candidate and they are a good candidate, we will still want you. <laughs> so please do not be sitting there thinking, oh, I'm in, you know, in a more rural area, which is typically a lower top turnout. Um, do not let that put you off, please, um, because, you know, if you are the right candidate for us, we still want you wherever you are. Yeah, and, and if there is already a candidate in your electorate, you you don't, it's great if you live in the electorate you're representing, but if you if you live nearby and have connections to another electorate, um, mm. you know, next door or something, that's also fine. Yep. If, you happy, if you happen to live out in Mosgiel or Tairi, you know, down in Dunedin, you know, there is a two electorates there. I can't cover both. Um, yeah, it's, it's that kind of thing, right? If you have neighbouring electorates and we already have one candidate in one, um, you know, it, it's totally fine um, to be, you know, in a, in a nearby or neighbouring electorate. Uh, probably would at least keep the islands the same. So definitely live in the South <laughs> Island, go on to South Island. It's, it's a bit much to fly in, in COVID times. Uh, but also like the... COVID does change what a campaign will be, so it's hard to know how much there'll be meet candidates and things like that um, in 2023. So I know 2020 was a lot fewer than usual, which in a way actually made it um, much easier um, to attend the meets because there was only, for me, there was only probably about a dozen total 
Um, so between that and interviews with journalists and things like that, the, the kind of the minimum commitment wasn't too much. Um, it was a fairly manageable thing. If I just turned up to all the meets um, and, and responded to um, journalist questions, it was a fairly manageable couple hours a week, but it was all the, the extra stuff that, that really bumps that number up. Yeah, and I think going back to kind of a big theme of this evening, which is a strong candidate's only really as strong as their team, um, because so much, you know, because you're always spread so thin, there are so many jobs that you end up doing. Um, but if you had a bigger team, probably more of the more slightly peripheral stuff would be delegated out. So again, your effectiveness just depends on um, how many people in your area are able to be part of the team. And, you know, for some people it's who don't want to be front facing, handing out flyers might be something that they feel comfortable with. And that's huge. That makes a massive difference. So yeah, there's no job too small. Um, every, everything helps and yeah, genuinely everything does make a big difference. There is um, one question that's just popped up there of what are we really looking for in candidates? Um, and I mean, there's a, as we've said, there's a huge variety of um, talents that you can bring. One of the core, or a couple of the really core skills, I would say, are definitely um, speaking to people. Um, and that is either in a one-on-one, -on -one, in a group, or, or public speaking. Um, it's hard to be a candidate and not speak. Um, so that is probably one area which I say is, is a very core skill. So if you know you're a good people person, if you can enunciate well, if you can speak well, I know I speak way too fast. It comes back in my feedback every year from my students. Um, but you know, so it, it, that public speaking, or even if you're not good at public speaking, be able to speak to people um, in smaller groups and one-on-one, -on -one, that's probably one of those really core skills. Um, I don't know, what do you think about, what, what would be your top, top one or two skills there? I would, I would, the bit about um, like speaking well, I would say I'd slightly disagree with that, or at least broaden our definition of what it means to speak well, Good. because I know we would love to have a more um, diverse range of candidates and anyone who can speak to their communities in a way that their communities will relate to. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, we have a little bit of a reputation for, you know, possibly being a little bit. Um, a little bit on the nerdy side, and if you are relatable to... That's my electorate. <laughs> <laughs> my electorate's the nerdy one. That's why I get away with it. Um, They're yeah. all a little nerdy, aren't they? Yeah, I, yeah. I, Deneen I, North I, just happens to be a really, um, yeah, uh, heavily on the nerdy side. I think that's um, partly why I can get away with speaking quickly. But, yeah, I, I absolutely agree there, Jess. It's about uh, being representative of your community. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it really, I mean... You don't you don't have to be um, outgoing or confident or extroverted. Uh, some of those some of the confidence the confidence will come. I would say that um, liking people. Otherwise, you're just going to get really really tired because you're going to be around people all the time. Um, so if you if you like people and um, can um, I guess can relate to people, so have some emotional intelligence. Um, yeah, I would say that's probably the number mm -hmm. one thing. Yeah, I think I think both of those are really connected. It's your ability to connect with people and communicate to them in a way that's meaningful for them, in a way that they're going to understand what it is that we stand for and we what we can offer them. Um, and it's that it's that passion, it's that drive. And if you care so deeply about your community and you can communicate that passion, that is going to resonate with people. And for me, the biggest thing is people, like for me, if I could pick one thing that you bring, it's your integrity. Because if you do not bring integrity, I'm sorry, we are, we are not the team for you. Um, yeah. you. People can smell a rat a mile away. And if you cannot be authentic, if you cannot be true and honest, um, we're, just, we're just not going to be the party. This is something I've talked about in um, public forums before, that, that politics is absolutely riddled with Slytherins, but Tom <laughs> is not, you know, and, and, and Slytherins are, are you know, are, are wonderful, you know, that sort of determination and, and sort of things is, is great, but I would say that Top is not riddled with 
Slytherins. We're not. We're most of the people who are on top. I think are probably. God, I'm just saying that we've got a bit of a reputation for being a bit nerdy, and I'm. You bring out the Harry really Potter. Playing into this. Oh, yep, yep, dive in. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> we did say we wanted to keep it light this yeah. evening. Um, so does gonna, that make us like a Hufflepuff or no? <laughs> well, I would guys, say guys, that, guys. We, that we probably cover, cover the rest of our candidates. I feel like we've got, we've got a good lot of, lot of Gryffindors. Um, and, you know... Look, the reason the reason I'm a candidate for top and not for, I'm sorry, shy. The reason I'm a candidate for top and not for anyone else is because um, I'm not uh, capable of standing up and putting my hand on my heart and defending stuff I don't believe in. And and I think that's something you know. That's why we've got so many people um, involved in top who have never belonged to another political party before, and I never mm. had. Um, yeah because we we people who are here because top is different and this is what we this is what we believe in and that's what we want to stand for so i don't think that we um have candidates who are involved because they want to be in a position of power or because they love the political game you know you might you might want to get involved in, in strategy or something if, if you if you, you know but i think our candidates are generally people who are there as, as shy said because the um the, the the passion and the heart and the real belief that um that what we stand for could make a real difference to um to our country yeah there was okay, one so there's one little um thread that came back it was a while ago but i thought just touch on it a tiny bit someone was saying um is uh, volunteering for a candidate kind of like an internship i um, mean i think that yeah if you're a little on edge about what it means to be a candidate and you're not sure and but you happen to have someone who's already a candidate in your election go and uh, electorate sorry go and help them out because it's the best way to figure out what it actually is like um, and there are so many things you can help with so that's a, a really good way if, if you are on that fence because we are looking you know into the future still um, yeah, help volunteer in 2023 so you know what it looks like if, if that's what you want for 2026. Totally. Or seven if the election reforms come through. Um, <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Um, so there were just two last things I wanted to cover off really quick from the comments that I've just seen. One was a question around how we mobilise younger potential top voters and what is different from now that we didn't have last year is that we have an official youth win. So young top. So please go find them there on Facebook, Instagram, the usual places. Um, and so feel free. But I just I know it's not relevant, but I saw it and it, I'll just send you that way. The last question we wanted to cover off this evening is um, how do you apply? If you're feeling motivated and you're thinking, you know what, I'll just give this a go. Um, we will be opening formally applications next year, but you can go on our website already onto the support and then into volunteer and um, you can fill in your details and um, it, it's an expression of interest basically. So go onto the volunteer, put in your details and you might see other roles there as well that you might want to do on the meantime um, and set out your skill set because we might um, have other roles for you in the interim. So yeah, that's yeah. basically it. Um, I don't know if there was anything else that you guys wanted to cover off, but I just wanted to say to everyone watching real quick, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's been such a while since we've been here to, to chat with you. And so thank you. I just really appreciate everyone tuning in. Um, yeah, and, and I, I guess, you know, if you're, if you're thinking, you know, maybe this is something I would consider, and if you're thinking, you know, but I'm too old, but I'm too young, but I don't have the right qualifications, but I don't sound right, but I don't look right, but I have a disability, but there are other candidates who look like me, um, we want you and you have something to to offer and you're not on your own. There's a wonderfully supportive team of candidates and volunteers who are there to offer you and to, um, you know, you, you have something to offer and um, please think about it because um, yeah we, we, we want we want our um, team to look more like our country um, and yeah there's no like we said before there's no one right way to be a great 
candidate. There are a million ways to be a great candidate and and you are one of the ways. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Okay, well, um, that's probably a perfect place to, to wrap this up this evening. Thank you, Jess and Ben. It was so nice to see you both. <laughs> even though we digressed into Harry Potter for a wee moment, but other than that, it's been great. Um, it's so nice to, to work with you both. Um, and also that should be a draw, draw card just in and of itself to work with these two amazing people. Um, and the rest of our team are also incredible. So um, thank you so oh. much for joining us. Ben, do I, do I, do I I'll leave it to you for the last word. Yes. Little, little 30 seconds. <laughs> um, it, it, one thing that played on my mind a lot coming in was how is this going to affect my job? Um, and so I thought I'd just touch a little bit on that, that um, being a, a candidate with integrity uh, has had, I think, a net benefit um, to my job. Um, I now have students who recognize me, which is fun. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's people have been very supportive of me when I've come back into work and I've actually, it's just been quite a positive overall experience. Um, you can definitely have a really wide variety of jobs, be a candidate and still have that job in a very wholesome way. And Top is really unique in that, well, not only just unique, unique, but because we're such a nice central party where we're really evidence-based, we're, we're driven in that way, we're very palatable to a huge range of people. So it, it helps with that. Um, yeah, so it's for me that that part wasn't an issue. I was concerned about it, but it ended up being quite um, quite enriching. And if any public servants want to ask me about the experience of being um, involved in the in the core public service and being a politician, then um, yeah, just message me. It's possible. Mm. And thank yeah, you so much for inviting me along, Shay. Shay. <laughs> Oh, it's so good to see you guys. Okay, right, well, let's wrap it up there. Thank you again so much for joining us. Kakite.